Good afternoon, everyone. I might have to stand just a bit for this. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Doug McDougall, Chair of the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning, and I'd like to welcome you to the first of three uh, series that we have here, Forum on uh, Different Topics that we're going to put together from the Center for Science, Math, Technology. And tonight, the first event is going to be talking about uh, what will schools look like in 25 years from now, a focus on technology. And so I'm going to moderate the um, event today, and we have a number of speakers, so I'll just introduce them, starting with my first left, uh, Earl Woodruff, and then Jim Slada, um, Marlene Scarlamilia, Jim Hewitt, uh, Alexander Makos, and Claire Brett. And they're going to be talking to you about what schools will look like in 25 years. What I want you to know, though, is that's in 2037. If they start talking about something in 2034 or 33, put your hand up. I'll try to stop them, keep them on target after 25 years from now. Anyway, the, the idea is that the first uh, part of this session will be a five-minute presentation by each of the uh, five of them, six of them, followed by a couple of questions that I will ask and then invite the audience to ask some questions at that time as well. Uh, we will have a little uh, microphone here, so just come up at that time. I'll invite you uh, to ask questions, and it can be directed either to an individual or to the entire group, your choice. So I'm going to uh, myself sit down here out of the way, and we'll begin with um, our doctoral student, Alexander Mekos. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on higher education and what technology um, will transform the higher education experience for us in 25 years. Over the past 25 years, we've seen a few trends um, that have now sort of come to the forefront in our discussion about higher education. And those three trends are moving courses online, where more universities have decided and opted to develop online programs. Uh, the second is this move towards digitizing textbooks and using digital resources and incorporating that type of content into courses. And the third is this ubiquity of cheap technologies that have come up in the classroom and have now started to transform the classroom because both instructors and students are walking into lecture halls and to um, their learning environments with different types of technology, whether it's smartphones, iPads, tablets, um, laptops, they're everywhere. So we see these three uh, trends that have come up and I think these are the ones um, that will be more prolific within the next 25 years and really shift and, and change the look of higher education, not transform it radically, but enhance the experience. So for moving courses online, we have seen now an increase in dis dis distance education. And what this really allows is people from all over the world in remote parts, those who not, cannot necessarily access major universities and towns, allow them to partake and obtain a university degree. And we're really seeing this move towards content knowledge being delivered over online courses. It's um, a different model to provide everyone with all of this information and have access to it. And really, it's up to the individual to personalize and make meaning from this information that they're receiving. So we see that instructors and students can learn and engage in learning at any time, anywhere um, type of space. So when it's convenient for the individuals to engage in learning content or engaging and collaborating with peers on projects, this is now made accessible. And I think this will be um, heightened in, in 25 years because the technology will only get better. More people will be connected and constantly and have different modes of connection. Um, the next textbooks. So we see in uh, outside of education this absolute explosion of animation, video production, personal production of videos. YouTube has just taken over the internet essentially. And this is starting to transform education. We're seeing it right now. Um, and professors are recording their lectures and posting them, and students access them outside of class. And it's providing different mediums for um, all of the content to be disseminated. Now, what this means is that textbooks being digitized 
you can imagine being at home, studying for a test or reviewing material and being able to access different types of animations, uh, say for biology, if you're studying biology, you can access a uh, digitization of cells and explore cells in a different way. And it allows you to understand and engage with the material in a way that is more interactive and isn't just words or one image. It's motion movement and moving through your material in a way that allows you to understand it at a deeper level. Um, and we see several examples of this also come up in, dig in uh, mobile applications. There is, has been um, wide uh, creation of these mobile applications in neuroscience and chemistry where you can literally be on the subway and studying the different parts of the brain and understanding how they work. And um, this is really fantastic because it allows you to draw from different resources and learn from really the best sources that are out there right now. And the last is cheaper technologies. So we I'm envisioning that we walk into a lecture hall in 25 years from now, and there are screens everywhere. And what you're seeing is a space for students and instructors to work together and interact with material in a way that we they're all connected and visualizing and moving things around. So I'm picturing like Xbox Connect standing um, in front of it and literally manipulating molecules in chemistry, uh, in a chemistry lecture to understand their composition, to understand how they break down. Um, using your smartphone, which is definitely going, like is where we are moving to, as a source um, of information that you can essentially air, like what Air Apple does now for AirPlay, and upload on a screen and say, okay, this is what I'm working with, this is what I'm, uh, this is what I'm interested in, and this is how I, I'm understanding it. So it's really um, enhancing the learning experience, and I think that's where we're going in 25 years with technology for higher ed. Thank you very much. Uh, next will be Claire Brett. Okay. Um, well, I started thinking about this, and I thought, you know, I suddenly realized how old I was going to be in 25 years, and and I thought, well, that's a really horrible thought. So, um, um, and 25 years is a long time, right? And most things change a lot in 25 years. But schools, and I'm thinking about education in more broadly, not just just at the higher ed level, have always been very resistant to change. And um, so I'm thinking, I was thinking about what might make them change in the next 25 years. I mean, technology is one of the, the one of the factors, but I think there are some other ones too. Um, so the, a big question for me is like, what, who is schooling for? You know, what is schooling about? Why are, are we schooling and for whom are we schooling? And I think those are gonna be increasingly bigger questions as we move um, into the next 25 years. Um, actually, um, Chris Deedy from Harvard uh, said this, and it's a little quote. At this point in history, the primary barriers to altering curricular, pedagogical, and assessment practices towards a transformative vision of ICT and education are not conceptual, technical, or economic, but instead psychological, political, and cultural. And I think that that's, um, I think those are really quite wise words, actually, for, for educational change writ large. Um, and, you, you know, if you look at what happened with technology to date um, on schooling, you, you know, I mean, everyone around here has been engaged in this very activity for, you know, a long time. Um, and it's really hard. You get pockets of really cool things happening, but getting large-scale change has been very, very difficult. And that's the story of a lot of the uh, educational technology efforts. So I, what I do think may happen, though, is that um, technology is definitely be going to become increasingly ubiquitous and personalized. And I have this, that in my happy days, the, my vision of it being where I think it's really positive is that we get maybe beyond having screens, you know? Right now we're all walking around and actually getting run over, I noticed a lot recently, with, because everyone is like this. And um, if we could get past screens, which I think we will, because I think that's where technology is headed, 
that I think may herald a, a different kind of way of communicating. And that kind of communication might work very nicely in, it could transform distance learning. It could make it more of a, um, uh, an apprenticeship experience that actually had um, really interactive properties. I still think we have a long way to go with interactivity. Um, so schools really, and, and I'm not sure that this is going to change. They have this sort of many, um, sort of one-to-many model, right? The teacher's there, and it's such a, it's such a, you know, um, impervious structure. And I'm not sure um, it's lasted from the 19th century, and we're still doing it. So I'm not entirely sure what will will change that part. But I do think there are some pressures from the outside, and one of them is is the economic pressure. It's the relationship between um, commercialization and um, globalization and what education gets to be about and who decides what education is going to be about. Because those, if we don't, you know, along with sort of inventing new and interesting technologies, we have to have a, there's a social voice in here that needs to really be um, spoken loudly. And we need to look very critically at what's happening because um, without that kind of um, monitoring, um, I, I worry that things are going to get harnessed in very... Um, unproductive kinds of ways, or at least get out of our control. That education won't be not just about education, it'll be um, education for the economy. And it wasn't very long ago, those of you who remember Mike Harris, and there, remember there was a time in there and they were sort of, they were trying to throw subjects out of school. They said, geography, who needs geography? Let's get rid of geography. And, you know, those kinds of things, it didn't actually happen quite then, but as, you know, there are certainly forces in play where um, I think this is something we have to consider as um, time goes on. And so my most pessimistic view of this is that, you know, that in fact the digital divide will just get larger. Public education will go in a bad direction the way sometimes it looks like it's going in the US. And that we just put a new class structure in place and, um, and marginalize another group of people. And so that's the thing I really don't want to happen. On the other side, I see that there are some, um, I think technology has a lot of possibilities and hopes and, um, and I think it's a way that you can, you can, it can be used to make things better, but it's not, it doesn't lie in the technology, it lies in us and how we use it. Thank you, Claire. Uh, next is Jim Hewitt. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, I largely agree with both of the previous speakers, uh, particularly Claire, with regard to uh, uh, elementary and secondary schools. Um, I, I think the problem here is um, that if you, if you look at the technologies that have really succeeded in, in schools over the past, um, say, 100 years, we'd have things like blackboards and data projectors and uh, maybe calculators. Uh, we'd have um, uh, various video devices like um, like document projectors and video cameras and video projectors and so forth. And when you look at all the things that have really worked in the classroom over all that time, most of them are transmissive technologies. You know, most of them are about uh, the teacher as presenting some information to a bunch of students who are sitting at desks. Calculators, you know, are used by students at desks and everything else. Smart boards nowadays, they're all used by teachers. And we seem to be having a lot of problems getting past that and doing things that are innovative and that involve students collaborating together and doing inquiry work. Now, it's not like we haven't tried. Okay, like people, as Claire said, the people around this table, we've developed a lot of innovative technologies and we've put them into classrooms and we've gotten the, the teachers to use them and they've been great. And there are hundreds of other educational technology researchers around North America and Europe and across, around the world who have done the exact same thing, but none of them ever seem to succeed. They, they don't get past this stage. And so despite years and years of work on this and all of these innovative technologies, uh, Ultimately, no, none of us have produced anything that comes even close to PowerPoint in terms of its effect on schools, okay? And it's, it's sad, but it's true, right? And, and the problem here is, is, again, not our technologies, um, but the problem is, is that it's, technologies do not change schools, or at least they have very small effect on schools. It's rather that the dominant culture of schooling chooses which technologies they're gonna use. 
teachers are in a sense gatekeepers. And if the technology is not helping them do their job, then they're not going to use it. And so this is why we can have pockets of success with teachers that we work with, but, but making a wide scale change that's been very, very hard. Now, given that, if I were to predict ahead 25 years, um, I, I think there will be some changes. But as Claire says, changes are very slow. Carl Breider used to say, if you walked into a classroom in 1900, you would immediately recognize it as a classroom. It, it's, it looks very much like classrooms look like today. And I think they'll look like that 25 years from now. But I think there will be some changes. Uh, again, I think that the changes will be um, uh, data projection. I think that, again, display technologies are very important. I think data projectors will get cheaper, smaller, more powerful, easier to use, <laughs> hopefully built into the ceilings. So data projection will be, will be there, I believe, in 25 years. <laughs> okay, I think I, I agree with, uh, with Alexandra that textbooks are going to disappear. You know, we, we have iPads. This is it's cheaper for the uh, school board. These things change faster. Uh, I think touch-based technologies make, will make resource, you know, getting access to information much, much easier. So I can imagine students all having uh, easy access to, to touch-based technologies where they can get information. I think there will be better communication between child and parent and teacher. And you can see this starting already. Um, you know, quite a lot of teachers are already posting their lesson plans or their, their lessons and worksheets and so forth online. Parents can go in, they can help their children with it. There can even, even be communication between parent and teacher and you can imagine people having Skype calls instead of parent-teacher meetings. So that seems to be another trend that's very positive. But again, it's in the service of what teachers normally do. I think there'll be more uh, online resources for children in different ways. I think technologies now allows children to go online in the evening and contact other people in their class and ask for help. Uh, there are resources like Khan Academy, which allow children to go on and get extra resources if they need additional help understanding Pythagorean theorem. They can do that. Um, and the teacher can provide them with directions. And you know, if you, you seem to need more help in this area, you might consider this video or this resource that's online. So I think in the olden days, they just had the textbook and their notes to rely on. Now they're going to have a whole wealth of resources online that they can go to, which will allow for good students, strong students, to, to move ahead if they want, and allow for poor students to receive remediation more easily. Finally, I think there'll be better assessment tools. A lot of what people are going to be doing is going to be digitized now. A lot of what kids are going to be doing is going to be digitized. And for example, my sister is using the program Pepper, which is a, a pr project we've developed here, to have her ESL kids talking to each other online by typing in messages to each other and then they respond back. This is an ESL class in high school. And then she can use Pepper to get a, grade, a diagnostic about at what grade level they're working at. So I can imagine more of those kinds of autom automated assessment tools that will allow teachers to make more informed diagnoses of their students. But as for the basic model of teaching and learning, I think it's going to be one teacher too many, just like Claire says. It's my opinion. Great. Thank you, Jim. Next is Marlene Scott-Amelia. So ours is quite a popular topic. Uh, Steve Pakin is running an Education 2030 series. Not quite as far out as we are, but um, you know, hanging in, right? Um, many journalists are dealing with the topic, and um, uh, foundations are requesting proposals to get some vision of what uh, education will look like uh, 25 years from now. Most visions uh, feature technological enhancements. To read these, uh, it's really that we'll have interactive technologies. We will have all of the things this team is uh, has been working on, the games, the social media, the uh, uh, immersive environments, smart tables, smart classrooms. So these are just, uh, I, I think, the frame this vision of the future. So the question that frames my comments is will these new technological forms reverse the pernicious, the rich get richer phenomenon of education? So let me just say a little bit more about what this phenomenon is. 
the closest to a natural law that we have in education is those who enter school with more knowledge leave school with more knowledge. And education has not managed to reverse that. It's much the same as in uh, business context. Um, so there are two forces that uh, serve to divide. The one is you come in with less knowledge, or more, uh, depending on which uh, side of the divide you're on. Then we have technology which uh, can greatly enhance the uh, uh, difficulty so that if you need to explore the web, you're no longer so clear what the sources are, you have difficult sourcing information. Um, so finding information, reading those resources uh, is uh, more difficult for students who have less knowledge. Then if you take, if in fact you're on the positive trajectory, that is, that it, it is greatly expanding what you're capable of doing, then innovation is yours. You are actually open to wide avenues of resources, great potential. On the other hand, the students who are not so capable are at best lurkers and uh, uh, consumers of that knowledge as opposed to the innovators. So we really have two trajectories that are uh, serving to, to create a divide. Now the other divide is a kind of modern segregation. And I think Alan Collins elaborates this most effectively. He says if you just take factors such as homeschooling, um, the fact that you can now take many courses and get uh, um, badges on the web, you uh, have charter schools. Well, the very students and families who are, who are on the innovation trajectory tend to take greater advantage of those uh, uh, new forms. And so that is yet another enhancer of this divide. So our semantic tools offer us just incredible opportunity and in at the same time uh, they increase the potential danger from this um, um, knowledge innovation divide. So curriculum now, um, wildly uh, accessible, <laughs> exciting resources, incredibly efficient uh, uh, curriculum now on the web. There's a sense that, uh, in fact, it's cheaper. We won't have to pay curriculum publishers. But in fact, the curators who have kind of given us the safe zones of what knowledge students need, those people who have packaged the expertise, um, are no longer being called upon to do that so much and publishers fear for uh, the future of, of textbooks. If you take assessment, as Jim suggests, wild and amazing new capabilities, feedback on the fly, just in time as you uh, proceed. Um, on the other hand, uh, the uh, assessments that will uh, be available for people not engaged in that will not be the immediate feedback, but uh, continued uh, dependence on the externalized feedback. So, uh, you know, I just actually have come across this term transliteracy, which is the, the difficulty of finding coherence in the World Wide Web. So you have all of these uh, uh, resources, and people are, are really talking about, so what, how do we get from the basic literacies to coping with this notion of needing to find coherence across very different media, different resources? So we have to be a little bit modest. Not only do we have the rich get richer phenomenon, but education is actually marked by the fact that we haven't democratized the basic literacies, let alone getting us onto the trans literacies. So there's a very deep irony that our social media place new pressures on individuals. Now I found a really interesting quote. I think it's kind of in the category with Christidis' quote. Uh, it says, basically, the issue is writers extol virtues of collective intelligence in a community that knows everything, and individuals who know how to tap the community to acquire knowledge on a just-in-time basis. The problem, of course, is there's great imbalance in who does the work, who benefits, who lurks, and who innovates. So I argue that the most pressing need uh, currently is not to find niches in our current schools where we can enter technology into those niches. Our real challenge is to fundamentally change education. Innovation, now the rarest of school-fostered capabilities, 
that's the one way out there on that innovation trajectory, is the one that has to become part and parcel of the ordinary. It has to be the new basic. And instead of flipping schools simply so transmission takes place outside of school and dialogue takes place in school, one of our biggest challenge is to flip this notion that we, after the basics, we move to higher order and in fact get innovation in from the very beginning of school. So my prediction for 2030, gaps will increase unless we can demonstrate a clear, effective, education for innovation alternative. Our biggest technological challenge is to create technology that allows innovation to be part and parcel of the ordinary. Okay. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, the next is Jim Slada. Hi, I'm a faculty member here at OIC. My research is in technology. Um, right in front of me. Okay. Thanks. Technology for learning. Uh, in particular, I, I have a program of work on smart classrooms and bringing the physical classroom into play in the learning. So I'm, I'm very vested in the discussion about what things will look like in 35 years, but I think maybe I have the most uh, cautious um, or, or maybe agnostic view of what, what that's going to look like. I don't think it's knowable. Um, I think we're in a, a period of transition. I think if you asked about 35 years or 45 years from now, you're probably on, on safer ground uh, in terms of things being at least stabilized. But my guess right now is that we're stuck in this kind of institutional bind where, yeah, so society and the, and, the, and the history of schooling is dictating that secondary education needs to teach us X, Y, and, and Z. And Teachers are, somebody said gatekeepers, but they really up against that, that uh, task demand. And I don't know if I agree with Dee Dee uh, altogether. I don't, if I was a teacher out there right now up against that task demand, I don't think there is a whole range of great alternative pedagogical designs that I can use that aren't, uh, you know, that are, that are somewhat, that are that disparate from lecture and, and question and answer. Uh, otherwise, teachers would be using them. I assure you, um, it's uh, it w we all know uh, how easy lecture is to do this one-to-many uh, transmissive style, and as long as schooling makes the demand that we cover all of high school physics in a semester or or whatever you have, that's going to continue to be a tough paradigm to beat. Lecture that is. Um, so I'm hoping that the task demands are going to change. I'm hoping that we're going to get. Um, maybe, maybe in association with shifting economic drives that we're going to have teachers now in secondary being told that their kids need to maybe instead emerge with uh, having had a deep learning experience and coming out with a personal learning plan for the summer or something, that their expectations are going to shift. That's going to let a new bunch of pedagogical models um, bloom. Meanwhile, because I don't want to really fight that fight in terms of what that's going to look like, my my personal perceived um, job that I want to do is to, is to advance ways of interacting in the learning environment. So I'm trying to, to, to stay, you know, several, at least a couple of decades ahead of the, the status quo in terms of the questions that I ask, although I do my work in the situation of uh, UTS high school here and ICS elementary. Um, I spent 10 years working at uh, University of California, Berkeley, on a web-based learning environment. That's not an environment where you learn on the web, although now that's what we would think. But in 1995, we really thought the web was going to come into the classroom and kids were going to learn using the web in the classroom. Um, and McLuhan told us that we were going to sit kids in rows of computers looking at them as if they were mini lecturers, right? And that's exactly what we did. Uh, and if you showed me a photograph of that right now, and I look at a picture of all of these kids in the WISE learning environment, 30 of them at, sitting at, no, we still did two computer, two, one, one per two. It looked uh, humorous. But on the other hand, what, we, what I learned from that experience was the teacher's role changed dramatically. When we were running a WISE project, which only took about a week of curriculum time, um, that was already too much for most secondary teachers to allow. 
the teacher was off the stage. The teacher was in the room. The teacher was walking around, listening to what students had to say, looking at what was on their screens. That was before screens were this big. Um, and interacting with kids deeply on a one-to-one -one basis. So that was the beginning of my thinking that actually technology, when it's in the room in a fairly deep way, does change the dynamics of what was going on. And it didn't take me too long to start thinking about how, what if they didn't all have to be doing the same activity? What if they were doing different activities? Or what if one group's activity was informing the next group's activity and they became kind of scripted in a complex uh, sort of format? Um, these are the kind of things that I've been working on since arriving here. Um, I think jumping from that conceptualization of curriculum through the, the, the screen into curriculum in the room and trying to imagine the walls and the, the floor and the furniture coming into play in a digitally enhanced way. Uh, my group has been investigating these kinds of uh, new pedagogical models for um, I, you know, I'm most excited about secondary science because I think that's a, um, a tricky nut to, uh, to try to crack, but, uh, but also primary and, and, and using some of the, 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 the pedagogical advancements that, um, I mean, she's a really tough act to follow on this panel because she was <laughs> 25 years ago innovating, uh, at a level that's still innovative even today. So I'm, I'm, if I'm, is that right? I said all these 25 years. I know, there's too many. If I'm 25 years from now, I still, I still believe that I'll be looking hard at this collective epistemology and what does it mean for kids to be in it as a whole, not learning from me to do better on the exam than him, uh, not doing well on, on learning, but actually we're in it together and we're building on each other's ideas. So in my work, that's how I'm using technology to try to, to, to script out those activities a little bit uh, better and to study and advance the technology, the pedagogical technologies for how to, to make those, the, to choreograph that kind of learning. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, next is Zora Woodruff. Hello. Um, I was a little bit nervous of, of this topic because it's a bit of a fool's game to try and predict the future, I think, especially if it's longer than you can possibly imagine. If I look back at the last 25 years, I think that that uh, would make me rather humble as to how I could predict how things are going to go. I think there are a few people that have done well at that. Vannevar Bush did very well at it in 1945. Uh, Douglas Engelbart did very well in it in the 60s. Well, he didn't have to predict it, he just invented it. And uh, if you're those type of people, then you can have carte blanche at, at figuring out what's going to happen. But the rest of us have to be a little more circumspect. So I'm taking the perspective that what is it that doesn't change that much and how will that get affected? And that's where I, I look actually more to the work of uh, Sherry Turkle, looking at our changing relationship with technology. What's happened before and does that give us any hints as to what might be coming down down the line, and then how would that have some impact on the school and the classroom? Well, you know, 25 years ago, we were looking at computers as cognitive amplifiers, calculators, basically, helping the mind cope. And uh, not too long after that, we found out that the computer could also help with an emotional level, a silly little program called ELISA, uh, had people really treating it like a, a psychoanalyst and getting some benefit out of actually chatting away with this extremely s simple program. And from that, then we, we uh, started getting alternative identity uh, worlds with, with MUDs, multi-user uh, dungeons, taking that gaming world and putting it together into a, a context where, where people were spending a, a lot of their time um, interacting in this, this very digital world. And then we, the next sort of relationship level comes along and it's Tamagotchis. And they're the first little things that are asking us to love them. Um, and that's a, a pretty unique change in how we relate with, with and to technology. And um, 
not long after that, we get into the world of, of gaming that really gets seductive. And that's where we get the world of Warcraft and uh, games that are, that are played today to the point where it's calculated that something like 3 billion hours a week are spent in the gaming world. And that the relationships that uh, individuals in that world have with their technology is at a completely different level than anything else we've experienced in the past. And probably the strongest relationship that we could imagine with, with technology. Um, and on the cutting edge now, we've got robots that aren't like Tamagotchis. They're doing the opposite. They're reacting to us. They are modifying and watching what we're doing and relating to us, so it's becoming much more of an intimate, personal relationship. So it's growing on, on that level. But in, uh, at the same time, within the educational realm, over the last 20 years, what we've been doing is really continuing to push the cognitive side. We've tried to amplify that more and more, and working with content and having students relate to content mediated uh, through the machines. So we've been doing that, but outside there's been a number of, of moves that have really uh, advanced us in terms of our social emotional relationship to the technology. The, um, the interesting development now, I think, and it's very topical because Paul Tuff just spoke about it at downstairs uh, last week, and that's that one of the very good predictor predictors of uh, success with children are th character traits like grit. And if you're really concentrating on building character, it gives you another way to, to move ahead beyond just working at the cognitive level. So there are a number of character traits. I don't have in my five minutes time to get into them, but they're, they're there. So if we bring those together, um, I think we can start to imagine in the next 25 years, our relationship with technology is going to go further. It will go much more along the lines of being able to read us, having intimate relationships with these, this digital technology, and down to the point where within a millisecond it can tell what our emotional state is. It can read um, what our brain waves are. Take all of that and imagine then a learning guide that's, that basically looks at what's happening and says, oh, you're not ready to learn this yet. You're half asleep. You might as well uh, go to sleep for an hour. I'll wake you up and you can take, take a look at it then. Um, <laughs> at least that's what I'm hoping. Um, okay, I, I'm out of time. I would have told you exactly what was going to happen in the next 25 years, but, but for the sake of a bit of time. <laughs> thank you very much, Earl. Uh, thank you to the panel for their first uh, set of introductions and comments. Thank you very much. Um, so, of course, if I was on the panel, I would have had the first thought about technology is at least finding a way to make life easier for retired faculty or something like that would be a good place to start. Um, but they started in and had a couple of different ideas. So I'm going to ask the first question and then um, in a few minutes I'll give you an opportunity. So think about the question you might want to ask. One of the comments that uh, Marlene made, but others of you had talked a little bit about, is maybe the change in how the classroom will look. And so currently, students go to a classroom, the teacher does some activity, either PowerPoint or use of all kinds of technology or not, and the students then start their homework and then they go home and do their homework. Um, currently, there are a number of classrooms that are using a technique that they've referred to as flipped classrooms, in that students are actually at home taking a look at technology, watching the teacher or Khan Academy or some other um, video, and then come to school to collaborate with each other and do other things. So is this something that we can see in the future, or is it just a fad and something that's going to change quickly? I'm just open it to anyone who wishes to make a comment. Jim? I'll try, I'll try first. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think it's maybe more likely to be used in, um, in universities. I, I don't see it as being practical in 
elementary and secondary schools. I don't think, first of all, that you can ensure that the students are going to watch the video that you want them to watch, and, and that's a big, big, big issue. So um, that, that's one, one, one issue, which is the monitoring of it and make, making sure that students have the content. But the, the second more fundamental thing is, I'm not sure you really want to separate the presentation of the content and the working with the content and, and the dialogue about the content by that much, like you know, having them do one thing in the night and the next thing in the, the next day. So I, I tend to think it's actually a bit of a fad. I, I, and I think it, it may be the wrong question, as Marlene yeah. pointed out, um, but I would see uh, a, a more practical matter being, uh, like a more reasonable solution being that acquiring new content and talking about it and, and thinking about it is something you do both at home and at school. Just to dovetail off that, Dr. Jim's response, um, if in my mind in, in higher ed, the this is exactly what would happen. It would be some content knowledge delivered with that aspect of collaboration and being able to interact with your peers and your instructors. Right now, there are several professors at the university on main campus that are actually using Twitter during their lectures in order for um, students to ask questions when they're presenting the content because there are always some questions that come up when, when, when um, sorry, um, delivering the content to students. And whether it's a, a minor note or a minor question or something that more students have, um, I think we'll see that this hybrid model, um, well, hybrid in the sense that you'll be having more collaboration and more application integrated with the content delivery um, come up a lot more. I actually think one of the um, uh, changes that I uh, am arguing for this uh, a kind of um, education for innovation, it would actually force us to think not of the classroom within the activity structures and time periods that it now uh, that we now know, or the small group to large group. The, we are so accustomed to these activity frames that uh, define how schools run that I think if we start thinking of opportunism of a dramatically different sort so that these barriers between in school and out of school activities what students are engaged in what counts for the work they're doing the just flowing in a much more opportunistic system um, of affordances then of course we have to figure out so what does hold the curriculum together what does hold uh, uh, how do we assess how do we make sure everybody's making progress um, so it's quite a challenge, but I do think that uh, flip is just kind of like the tiny, tiny little wedge that says, you know, we can start thinking differently about how things are going to happen. Uh, but I think it's such a tiny wedge that it doesn't much give us a sense of, of where all we need to go. Okay, so I'll just add a little bit to that. Let's assume that you actually get the students in your classroom and of course they start looking at their phones and sending text messages and now we have tablets and they're flipping and they're on MSN and they're doing other things and of course they're playing games at home and different technology how do we and do you think technology will change um, our attention span in the future how do we get the attention of students who who are used to doing things very quickly now and not paying attention how might that change the way we teach for example Jim um, I, so I, I think cognitive load on a teacher is maybe the biggest bottleneck uh, for new forms of learning and instruction. Um, lecture is a great economical means of staying on message, making sure your maximum efficiency, and minimizing distractors and um, confusion or complicating factors, right? When we start introducing things like designs that, that say, I want kids to be enabled with their own technologies, I want kids to be collaborating with peers, as soon as I have to manage learning <clears throat> in those kinds of more complex formats, where I suddenly have to learn and listen to what kids know or what they're thinking, make course corrections, 
um, pay attention to what you might have on your screen, then I am, at, humans just, maybe we need the robot for that, honestly, because humans are, are limited in what they can uh, achieve unless they're really a, a guru, but even then, uh, my, so my sense is the technologies are going to emerge to help essentially teachers begin to orchestrate those things. We're going to start having lots yeah, of yeah. more uses of ambient technologies on the walls uh, where a student who's on an off-topic site that can get brought to their attention automatically, where, where teachers can get quick feedback from what students are engaged in uh, in a content way, um, and that basically we will, one of, the, one of the, the places to move forward on technology is orchestrational to help the teacher stay in a feeling of comfort and control and to help help get the students through those more advanced forms of learning. Well, I'll stay with the, the theme of relationships again and then ask what's really important in the, the school right now. And when it works and works very well, that is the relationship between the teacher and the child. And it's that teacher knowing that child in a way that really can motivate him or her and uh, make progress that way. So that's going to be, a, I, I think, a, an enduring feature. But to actually then predict what the classroom's going to look like, I don't think we can look to technology. Think of the technologies that have, have evolved since the classroom was around. Very few of them have had an impact on that. It's been mentioned on the pan, in the panel already. So I don't think it'll be the technology, but the technology will open up alternative ways that we might accomplish the job. What will probably make the difference, sadly, will be finances. If all of a sudden there's only 20% of the money available to uh, fund our classrooms, people will start looking for other ways. And if the technology has created a situation where it's going to be cheaper, more, more affordable, and a good prospect of being even better, I think then we'll start to see some change, but I don't think we'll see it driven by the technology. I think that that will be a, a, a co-conspirator in the change. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, these people actually are on the same couple of floors as me and I can ask them questions anytime. So I'm gonna stop asking them questions and give you a chance to ask questions. So just need to put up your hand and come up. We have a speaker, a uh, microphone, there we go. And uh, while you do that, if you just introduce yourself so that um, we can have a sense of who you are. Okay. Uh, my name is Agnes Claybeck, and I'm probably the oldest person in the room. Having been in education for 50 years, and I didn't start when I was 10. <laughs> so there are some large questions here that all, all of you have raised, important issues. Some of the ones that came to my mind were... Does education ch change society, or does society change education? And maybe it's too philosophical at this point. It leaves out the hardware and even the software and takes a look at, I guess, what has always driven schools and human beings. And just uh, to build on that a little bit, uh, higher education has been mentioned a few times but when you look at what actually happens in schools, even at the secondary level, never mind the elementary, it's parents who want their children to be in a safe and secure environment. Most parents, at least in the urban setting, are out there working. They want their children looked after. Some people call it babysitting. I don't like to use that term. However, the idea is similar. Look after my kid. Teach them. They're not going to necessarily tell us what to teach or how to teach, but certainly the relationship idea that Earl has brought up is very important for motivating kids. They want their kids motivated to learn. How is technology going to be motivational? How is it motivational now? Is it motivational for everybody and in what way? Motivational so that they can Twitter and tweet? or motivational so that they're actually acquiring skills and knowledge and values, and people really don't like that one, right? People don't want to touch the word values. A lot of parents don't want you to teach values, and yet we teach them all the time. So that's, 
and the privacy issues too that have come up. How is that going to be different? Right now, I mean, your identity can be stolen, you can have your picture out there for a jillion years, um, you know, all those things, are, are they gonna change? And critical thinking, I know that's a, word too, a phrase we toss around a lot, but isn't that the very first step in using anything, including the hardware and the software and the digital, et cetera? Okay, enough. I'm 73 years old and I'm probably too old to be here, but there you go. <laughs> no such thing as being too old to be anywhere. Thank you for your questions. Uh, she raised uh, three or four issues and I'll leave it open for you to select some, starting at the last one, critical thinking. She talked about privacy issues. And then did technology change society or does society change technology? And I'll leave it open for you to pick any of those issues. I mean, I, I can say that it goes with what I was getting at, to, that, that we don't know really where this is going, but we know that it's changing. It's an Alvin Toffler kind of thing, right? Um, we're entering this third wave, and, and we know that society is going to be different. We here with, within higher education can absolutely tell you that higher education is changing. Um, the issues that you mentioned are real. They're in schools. We have teachers that have kids wearing their headphones through class and, and flipping them off when they ask them to, to, to take them out. We have kids that are distracted. We have, you know, issues in the classroom. I guess for me, that's part of the equation of change. So from, from my work, I, I have to sort of put blinders on to that somewhat and say I need to, to focus on my own new ways of getting kids engaged in how to learn. And the institutional side is going to have to work itself out. I've got two kids in school. Um, I do trust that they've got good teachers and they're, they're helping them to stay on track. But from an academic side, from a research side, um, I think we need to identify the problems that we can work on and make sure they stay clean and clear so that our own work and our own findings can be um, you know, made accessible and uh, meaningful to as wide a, a community as, as possible. Um, I think there's still a really big gap between um, what we're doing, what the social uses of technology as they are now, and what's happening in, in schools. And a, a while ago, I looked at the research on, you know, all of the, the stuff about, you know, the, their brains are changing thing. <laughs> And I looked to see if their brains weren't changing, and um, well, the research wasn't that. And actually, there's much less than you might think. Um, and that's partly because, you know, we are fairly resistant um, creatures with minds and, and the way, you know, our ways of, of, of being. And it takes a long time. We still have to attend in order to learn something. We still have short-term memory limitations. We still have, you know, these are just our kind of ways of being. And I think the challenge for teachers right now, and it's a, it's a very hard one, is how do you understand that technology well enough that you can actually integrate it deeply into your own personal way of teaching? And that takes time, you know? And it's not made easier by the fact that technology changes way faster than either we can do research or teachers can keep up with everything that's going on. So I think there are really unique um, challenges that we're facing now in education because of those, those shifts. And, um, and we're a long way from figuring all that out. So I think I see this too as being a time of huge change over the next 20 years. And, and it could go in a lot of different directions. And it's kind of scary, actually. I mean, it's, it can be hopeful and it can also be scary because uncertainty is always a bit unnerving. Okay. Thank you. We'll take another question and we'll come back to, to some of these issues. Steve? Steve Anderson. I'm a colleague from uh, Leadership, Higher and Adult Education. Uh, <laughs> and uh, several of you mentioned in the beginning uh, uh, the, the frustration with uh, uh, you, you can find classrooms, you can find schools where you can do little pockets of change, but uh, your frustrations with how do, can we scale that up to system-wide change, but nobody actually talked about that and suggesting uh, their thoughts about that and how it might uh, happen uh, over the next 25 years. 25 years ago, right, I studied River Oaks uh, out in Halton, one of, like, one of the first school Apple 
infused schools, uh, but it didn't scale up in Halton uh, 25 years ago. So uh, I'd be curious about your thoughts about uh, what can we do actually to uh, you know, scale up, make system-wide the good parts of technology used in schools. <laughs> so I will, um, I guess, just make some brief, a really brief comment uh, to that question. I think for higher education, a systematic move toward the integration of technology, toward leveraging technology to enhance the student experience is, would be quite difficult, even in 25 years, because right now we still are experiencing this tension, and I think it's... Um, a little more inflated than it used to be, but the tension between teaching and research in higher education. And you have these instructors who just want to concentrate on teaching, although they may not have an, a background in, in pedagogy and how to teach adults, um, but they feel comfortable transmitting the content to students at the undergraduate level. Then you have the, the faculty who are focused on research and who are leading on the leading edge of innovation at uh, institutes across, uh, throughout the world. And um, I think to have a concerted effort and move everyone towards using technology in one specific way is not going to happen because it's unique to the individuals. And it was mentioned in um, our opening remarks it's very specific to individuals' use, to different subject matters. Everything is, is going to be, you have to tailor it to your own and see what technology can do for that faculty member, whether they are research-driven or, or focusing on teaching, on the teaching stream. So I would say it would be, it's more of a tailoring, but an awareness, knowing that the technologies are out there. So if you want to incorporate them, then you definitely can. And there should be support for it. There should be institutional support for that. It's just having that access to it. Um, I'm going to frame my comments to, to Steve in terms of uh, Agnes's first question uh, in this issue about can society change um, education. And I think it's worth thinking about tipping points. Like I think two of the tipping points that people have talked about have been uh, finances and technology. But I think the third really big tipping point for us right now is there's just a lot of unhappiness about education. Uh, there's a great push for 21st century skills. We don't know how to get critical thinking into the uh, uh, curriculum. We start uh, doing what we do. We say, oh, what's critical thinking? And we decompose it and we build new skills. And there's no evidence that that's making a difference, but it's actually a whole new movement. So now skipping from there to scalability and sustainability and Steve's comment, I'm actually fairly optimistic that the tipping point is actually leading us to a point where just governments everywhere realize there's a need for change. It's in the documents. It's in um, the, I, I think there are a lot of, call them the mavericks of the systems, but there are people who just know it's got to change. And I think once we can offer systems of change, really responsible, new forms of assessment, uh, not a fly-by-night, here's what we're doing, but if you just look at the people on this panel, we've been working with schools for... 25 years, and and they, they don't go away. I think it's a really a matter of people who want to make a change have a level of stability and uh, commitment to those kinds of changes, and our tools have gotten much more stunningly uh, positive in terms of us delivering what Ben Levin has always argued, uh, once you get 100 schools and you can actually show that trajectory of change. And my sense is that once we actually take that innovation trajectory and we actually show change for every student in a continuous way, that's going to be a big demonstration. And I think it's actually, um, I'm, I'm optimistic about modern models that are actually effective being looked at because people are looking for change. Um, Steve, I think you could probably answer this question better than we could, especially with all your work with Michael Fullen. And uh, you've been thinking about organizational change probably more than, than we have up here. But um, 
there are there are some things that um, we can we can look at and and say would it lead to deep systemic change. Um, that does happen with technology from time to time. Um, Facebook changed a lot of the way that uh, or relationships are are organized right right now. Um, ironically, we probably invented the verse 2.0 <laughs> Facebook for education up here, but it wasn't as much friend much fun as just talking to your your girlfriend or your family. Um, it was it it missed the mark in terms of being a killer app that way. Uh, Roy P complains about YouTube. He said we could have invented that, but we were on our way to trying to make a really good educational application. So these these billion dollar ideas that that uh, end up changing the world um, are these killer apps that you really can't uh, predict at the outset, or there would have been a lot more of us doing it, believe me. Believe me. Um, so if we got an educational killer app, it would immediately change uh, the, the system deeply. None of us seem to be able to figure out what that would be, and if any of you in the room know, talk to us. Um, but failing that, then I think it, it is going to be slow work that uh, and the change will will really come about when we're ready with the the software educational tools at hand and society's ready because conditions are right that tipping point is met and it all comes comes together but it's really difficult to know how to manufacture that it feels more like we're just in the middle of it and waiting for things to to happen that are sort of like a storm beyond our control. And I think there was a question at the back. Someone was just about to get up. Yes, come ahead. Hi, I'm Sara Punja. Uh, I teach part-time here at OIC, and I also teach part-time at UOIT. Um, at UOIT, uh, we are um, hired as, PhDs are hired as course developers, and we put all of our lectures online on YouTube. Now, I was trained with Marlene and Carl, and so at first I was like, this is anti-knowledge building, right? But it really seems to be working. What we're doing is we're um, putting all our lectures online on YouTube, and then we're using WebKF for the online collaboration, and we're using Blackboard to put all of our um, lectures and to organize all of our marks and stuff like that. So we're using a variety of tools. Uh, it's a completely online program, and so, but what I'm wondering is, um, are we just reproducing, like is YouTube just reproducing old pedagogies that we are trying to move away from? And if that's true, why is it that it's so successful? <coughs> okay. Yes. This actually goes to, the, to Steve's question as well. Um, one of the interesting things that happened to me coming into educational research in the mid 90s, um, I was hearing from people who had been in it since the, the early 80s. And they said, some, I, there was a comment made to me early on that I tried to remember because these are the things you, you remember about higher education and how it was a waste of anyone's time to get into researching higher education because it was just so stuck and so, you know, resistive to change and resistive to innovation. So that's why we're all in K-12, because it's, well, you, can, you can play around with things and, you know, higher ed. <clears throat> Ten years later, um, right about when I came here to Toronto, it, it, it jumped out at me that that had flipped on its head. And somehow, uh, amidst the institutional bindings and cultural, you know, um, what I call them, task, you know, demands of K-12, that one has emerged with the reputation of being, you know, intransigent and 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 tough to change. And higher education is just flush with good examples of innovation, not only of technology but of pedagogy. We have courses being taught with ten thousand students. Um, we have courses being taught in a blended way. We have um, all over the place examples of Facebook and LinkedIn being used in, in courses. This idea of putting your content on YouTube, um, there's so many aspects of that that are 
potentially um, groundbreaking and that can let you play around with what to do with the rest of your cycles of time and that can free your students up in terms of their their own load. So I guess I would say I applaud that that approach. It kind of puts your lectures and gives them extra energy as well because they're up online so they can be the gift that keeps on giving and, and, and you'll want to do an extra good job. Um, but it takes something away from, from that as well, right? So you, you need to make sure you keep your um, your face-to-face -face time and the quality of your interactions with uh, the students. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Jim. I mean, in a sense, you're right. Uh, I agree that YouTube is reprodu reproducing old pedagogies, as you say. Um, with with the exception of that, of course, that the nice thing about YouTube is you can stop the stop the video and you can go back and rewatch something, which is a lot nicer than a <clears throat> another kind of uh, just a regular lecture. But what's important is what you do with the other time, and uh, and that's what's innovative and and cool about your stuff is that you're using knowledge forum to to uh, to have some discussion about stuff. I think the and. You know, when you ask why is YouTube so successful, it's probably successful because it is reproducing old pedagogies, right? That's what professors like about it in a sense. But I mean, the, the, the problem we're gonna have, I think, I, I think these technologies offer an awful lot for, for post-secondary education, but I think there's gonna be a crisis coming at some point because a lot of professors don't want to do the stuff you're doing. They wanna stand up and give a really quick, a quick lecture and then leave, right? Like uh, a lot of professors don't have the the skills to to do what you're doing, which is to to encourage these kinds of discourse after hours. So so what are we going to do about that? Um, we've got Coursera, where you know thousands of people are are taking courses all at once, and they're trying to accreditate you know get accreditation for these courses and 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 grant degrees. If that happens, what's going to happen to universities? If if the university model, if, if everybody here, if they wanted to, could take a degree now at Harvard. I mean, there's a lot of, as I say, I think there's a crisis coming and it's gonna put professors in a very difficult spot. I, um, my first reaction to your question was, well, YouTube's fantastic. Yes, it does reproduce, like Jim said, um, old models, but not everybody learns between nine and three. And not everybody is awake and, and functioning at the exact same levels that they should be functioning at in order to succeed, in order to engage with whatever material it is. And I, one of the things that we're seeing now is with these online, um, online forums and even in textbooks, they've built in um, systems where it essentially tracks behavior and knows how long it took you to read this chapter or how long you were actively online discussing. Um, so we're learning a lot about behaviors and with Coursera, we're learning about behavior on a grand scale. So we, I learn best at five o'clock in the morning when I can do things at my own time and by the time everyone else is waking up in Toronto, I'm well through my day. So we we're really, we have this opportunity, this very unique opportunity right now to move into a point where the universities, schools, they're getting to know their clients a lot better because of all of this data that is sort of being filtered in. And we need to bring meaning to it and, and see how is this actually going to change everything. Okay, great, thank you. I think you're ready to ask a question. Okay, I'm Michael Rosenberg. Um, I'm uh, actually, I have an environment center out in Kensington Market, a little ways from here. Um, so I guess from what we heard earlier, it seemed like the transmission technologies were not really changing things, but the um, more intelligent technologies were actually um, displacing the teachers and I mean I think that's true in general I mean technology is a lot more than just transmission or communication even though that part had really um, accelerated over the last few years and almost to the point where people focused on that as almost the essence of technology and ignored the intelligent parts so I mean I think the future actually probably will be a lot different than the recent past um, 
And I, I mean, I'm not sure that we can just assume that, that education plays such a big role in that future. I mean, I think we're all sort of hoping that intelligent human beings will be able to keep up with computers, and that may not be the case. Um, I mean, the, the future may involve a lot less resources, a lot less available, and a lot more of it being all automated and, and things like that. So, I mean, if you can already see that starting to happen in classrooms, I think that that's more of a general trend than that. So, I mean, I guess my question is, wh why are we sort of all pinning our hopes on innovation when innovation has caused most of the world's problems? Okay. <laughs> I'd really argue that innovation has not caused most of the world's problems. Um, the uh, um, Homer Dixon has a uh, wonderful uh, uh, analysis of the ingenuity gap, and uh, basically what he does is take the world's problems and talk about just how complex and difficult they are, um, education, of course, being one, but um, finances, economics, uh, um, uh, health-resistant germs, you name it, the problems that society needs to deal with are truly complex. And um, to my mind, the innovators in the system have been so consistently teachers. They are the people interacting with the students. And uh, the uh, notion that somehow there are teams of people doing things and between the technology and the students is where the energy is um, seems not to take account at all of the fact that the innovators really are the teachers. And I think consistently, uh, if you can get educational um, systems that are um, really partnerships between universities, teachers, engineers, that's where we're going to find an awful lot of change um, in um, uh, society. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what you were saying about the, the transmission uh, uh, tweak on all of this, but it seems to me that we just kind of get crazy about transmission versus constructivism as if these are the only two dimensions on which uh, uh, education works. And I think this new mix of, I think what you're saying, what's exciting about YouTube is you can watch that lecture at five o'clock and I see myself as, you know, not a transmissionist person, uh, but I love to listen to good lectures. I love to tune out sometimes and just be in my space. So it's really the mix and match, and we're not gonna get the powerful mix and matches if we do what it takes to keep everybody on a growth trajectory. That takes innovation, that takes powerful teachers, and that takes the people who surround us here in uh, OISE. And I think it's actually part of the scalability issue too, because we'll form as new teams. Any other comments from the panel? Okay, we have time for another question. Yes, go ahead. My first name is Asal, and I'm from the statistics department, and I'm always interested in data analysis and, and hearing uh, all these sort of uh, ideas, how they would be integrated with um, essentially collecting a data to speak to see uh, what would be effective learning. And uh, just wanted to know, um, how would you go about sort of collecting the data in terms of uh, seeing these sort of uh, ideas and changes um, and essentially having uh, a model that illustrates this, uh, this sort of effective learning, uh, for instance, uh, changes and, 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 and transitions and all these things that you've talked about. So it's sort of a very general question that I just was interested to know uh, in terms of education. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, I mean, Marlene's uh, team has done some of the, the she's done, she's done some of the, the deepest research in this area, so if you have a lot of students working together in an online environment and working together and collaborating, the really wonderful thing is you can track all that, you can track everything they write, everything they say, and uh, then of course you can, you can run statistical, s simple stats that give you things like, you know, how often and how long people are logged in and, 
and uh, at what grade level they're writing and so forth. But Marlene is attempting to go a step beyond that and actually look at some of the, um, uh, the semantics of what they're writing and how that relates to things other people are writing. And hopefully at some place, and maybe I'm, you know, hopefully at some place actually get to a, a sense of whether people are making progress um, in their investigations and in their inquiry. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. The the uh, I mean, one of the new forms of assessment that I find very interesting, but I think more interestingly, teachers and students find it very interesting. It's like you take an expert corpus, which is the uh, uh, in the semantic analysis terms, it's just the text, the uh, formal text, what the experts are doing, and students can watch the extent to which their discourse touches on the concepts of the expert corpus. So they find it just really interesting, you know. Oh, I'm talking about the green stuff, but never uh, chlorophyll. Um, but the experts call it chlorophyll. So I, I've dreamed with Earl that games that actually make the intellectual engagement uh, interesting and that we can use these semantic tools to show where the growth is but also to foster the growth and provide levels of feedback that uh, actually keep students engaged in learning. Yeah, and just uh, one thing to add, like a couple of years ago, we tried something um, in Pepper where we took s messages that the students were writing in distance education environments in, in an online course about educational technology. We do a vocabulary match on the last 200 articles written in the journal Computers and Education and said, oh, you might be interested in this article because it's, it's related. So, you know, it's, it's kind of an intelligent way of getting them deeper in, involved. Yeah, I think there's a, a, some really interesting stuff happening right now, right at the edge of, of, of that point where we're, we're looking closely enough at, at the data that it will really help us make some good decisions. But there's, some, uh, there's a real need for statisticians coming down the road too because that's where I'm, I'm thinking uh, learning guides really can, can have a, a, a big impact. If your emotional state can be measured within milliseconds analyzed a profile put together, um, you've got the ability to be able to determine whether that student is engaged at that point in time. Imagine a YouTube video that's playing and all of a sudden it stops and you look at it and on the screen says you weren't paying attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> or uh, you get uh, uh, another field of data that's really quite uh, uh, fascinating and, and emerging right now while we speak is the um, that whole phenomena of uh, the curiosity cube where you have a million people tapping away at a cube together collectively trying to figure out what's inside this cube and there are trillions of cubelets that have to be uh, taken away to do that. Um, looking at that, that kind of data and figuring out how it is that people really can work together in massively large uh, groups can, could lead to all sorts of, of ideas that we could be using in education to uh, make progress in ideas too. So it's a, I think it's an, an exciting time for statisticians. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to make a comment quickly. Uh, some of the ideas that is described at the end here, Mercedes-Benz now has a car that uh, if you're not paying attention, it starts to beep. So it actually knows if you're paying attention to the road or some attraction. So we're not far off of that at this point. I'm going to just uh, interrupt for a moment and introduce um, John Wallace, who's the director for the Center for Science, Math, and Technology Education. Uh, it was John, I'll get you to stand up. It was John's idea to say we should try something new. And his thought was, why don't we try something about a, a panel and have people an opportunity to ask some questions? And that's what we've done. So John, thank you very much for suggesting this and also to, it was a really great idea. And also to the panel, I know we planned to go to six o'clock, but uh, we didn't want all of you to come as far as you've come today and not have a chance to individually get a chance to talk to the panel members. So we're going to stop the formal proceedings now and thank Claire, Alexander, Jim, Marlene, Jim, and Earl for the work that they've done to put together their initial presentation and for your answers. And then we'll just leave it open for your, all of us to mingle, talk to each other about the questions that were asked and some of the answers, as well as getting a chance to talk here. So again, thanks to the panel for your work. It was very great. Thank you.